And, uh, you know, the, uh, you saw the program last night. The laureates got uh, a, a minute after they received the sculpture uh, to, to speak. And uh, you can imagine when I told them that, what, a minute? You know, we have so much to say about this uh, what we are research and this. And I said, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. You'll have your chance tomorrow to be on the, on the panel and that. So I'm making good on my promise, so you see that have a chance to talk about what you've done. I'm, I'm especially grateful to Jeff Rakes for his willingness to uh, moderate uh, this panel. There, there were two, two dates that are in my memory forever about the World Food Prize. They came within one month of each other. September 12, 2009, Norman Borlaug passed away. One month later, on this stage, Bill Gates came on October the 15th and launched his African initiative. And I sat over on this side next to Jeff Rakes, who as the CEO of the Gates Foundation had done all of the work and coordination and management and along with Sylvia Matthews Burwell and Rod Shaw and putting this all together. And it forever be a point of pride. So Jeff, thank you. Jeff had a terrific career at Microsoft uh, and then uh, leading the Gates Foundation. Now he has his own foundation, but what you really have to know about him is he's a Nebraska guy. And, farming. <laughs> and, 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 and farming and that. So Jeff, thank you. Over great. to you. Super. Well, thank you very much. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here, and, and Ambassador Quinn, I appreciate your remarks. But I do just want to say that the success of, of the Gates Foundation really is, is not its financial, will not be determined by its financial endowment, but its intellectual endowment. And so given the laureates we have here today, I want to do a special shout out to a great example of that intellectual endowment, and that's our program officers. Lawrence Kent is here in the audience today. And it wasn't Bill Gates, and it wasn't Sylvia Matthews Burwell, and it wasn't Jeff Rakes who figured out the potential of what we have here today. It was Lawrence Kent. And so I wanted to say thank you, Lawrence, for bringing us here today, because you played an important role. You get the assist. Um, so I know we have a short period of time, so we're going to dive right into to questions. And you know, I want to start out with the question of evidence. You know, we've had a lot of discussion about how people suffer from uh, nutrient deficiencies, how biofortified crops can raise the level of the micronutrients. But I think at the end of the day, what we have to know is is that showing up in terms of addressing those uh, nutrient deficiencies and, and improved health outcomes. So, you know, Jan, maybe I'll start with you. What are your thoughts and, and how would you support the evidence? Thank you, Jeff. And I'm very pleased because in the past two or three years, several reviews have come out looking at food-based approaches for combating malnutrition. And they all mention in these reports that the best evidence base comes from the work on orange flesh sweet potato. And this didn't happen overnight. It's been a 15 year or so process. Uh, but there are many, uh, I would say, effectiveness and efficacy studies that were done where you have intervention groups and control groups. There was work done of a controlled uh, feeding trial in a school in South Africa where they used a modified dose response and showed the impact on vitamin A status. I led some work in Mozambique that was funded by the Micronutrient Initiative and USAID and Rockefeller Foundation initially and Harvest Plus, where we showed uh, really that we used an integrated approach of introducing the orange flesh sweet potato, but combined with nutrition education at the community level. And we were able to see a reduction in prevalence of vitamin A deficiency among young children of 15%. And then after that, uh, the Gates Foundation financed Harvest Plus to lead a big study where we went to scale in Mozambique and Uganda and really gathered even more evidence to show the impact of the integrated approach um, on uh, young child uh, vitamin A intakes and the intakes of their mothers. 
And the increases in both countries range from you know, two to three times compared to the control group. And in that study, um, we saw the impact on vitamin A status that was measured in Uganda. There's been work done led by Margie Haskell in Bangladesh that's shown the conversion rate. So, you know, 14 units of beta carotene and sweet potato convert into one unit of retinol, the vitamin A in the body. So we have one of the best evidence bases. Um, and it, again, I would say what it's saying is it's not a magic bullet. We have to do these interventions with good nutrition education at the community level. But the evidence is clear. We're improving knowledge for the long term, for the next child. And we're making a difference to the current household. Well, that's fantastic. Any of the other? Howdy, do you want to chime in? Yeah, it was, there, was, um, there was a lot of uh, skepticism among the nutrition community when we got started. They, they felt that the percentage of the nutrients that would be absorbed would be too low. That was the, that was the question. So Harvest Plus uh, has commissioned 14 efficacy trials for different crops and different nutrients. Uh, and most of those studies are in now. I'll talk a little bit about the iron crops. So we've shown that the high iron beans and the high iron pearl millets uh, will uh, reduce, iron, improve iron status, reduce iron deficiency. And in addition, we've shown functional outcomes. Um, uh, in, with the pearl millet, the children who ate the high iron pearl millet, their cognitive performance improved. The women who, who ate the high iron beans in Rwanda, their work performance improved. Uh, we have now the uh, zinc crops, uh, efficacy trials are out in the field and we're waiting for the results, but the bioavailability, the percentage of the zinc uh, that has been absorbed uh, is up around 15 to 20 percent, which is what we, where we need to be to show that the, the zinc status will improve. Got it. No, that's fantastic. In a moment I want to go to some questions about breeding, but before I do that, I the, one of the things that I'm very interested in, and I think the audience will be interested in, is that there's a, a lot of attention to a single uh, micronutrient, vitamin A. Uh, but as we well know, most people suffer uh, in hidden hunger from lacking in multiple micronutrients. And so, uh, you know, how do you in particular, I'd like to hear your thoughts on how you think that biofortification can do more to deliver the full set of micronutrients that are required in deficient populations? Right. Well, the, I, I think my first point is that um, we, have to, we have to keep our eyes on the final goal, which is improved dietary quality. Everybody needs to have, eat the full range of fruits, vegetables, pulses, animal products. That's, that's the final solution. Now, what biofortification does is deliver some nutrients in a very cost-effective way. So when we, for example, to give another example, when we iodize salt, that's a single nutrient, um, and it's delivered cost-effectively. So let's not, let's not think that biofortification, we're gonna, we're gonna solve the whole problem by putting all the nutrients in all the staple food crops. That's, that's not the concept. So we're looking where we can uh, deliver certain nutrients cost effectively. It's very difficult to use conventional breeding to breed uh, multiple nutrients in the same staple food crop. It takes a long, long time to do that. Uh, having said that, a very promising strategy might be to breed more prebiotics into the staple food crops. Prebiotics improve gut health and they may be able to increase the bioavailability of a range of trace minerals, and that may be a very promising strategy in the future. Oh, that's fantastic. Now, let, let's turn to uh, breeding, and you know, I thought Jim Kim's speech, by the way, yesterday was really fantastic. I hope everyone here had a chance to, to hear him speak. It was very inspiring, and, but one of the, the things about his speech is it really clearly articulated the magnitude of this issue. And I think he also did a good job of sense, uh, of suggesting a sense of, of urgency. I grew up uh, 
you know, my family were, were hybrid seed corn producers and, you know, certified seed. And it takes a long time sometimes to see some of these improvements get there. So the breeding cycles can be very long, but I think there's been some breakthroughs. In particular, I've heard a little bit about uh, the, the, uh, the ABS, the revolutionized speed of the alternate breeding scheme. So, uh, Maria, perhaps you could share a little bit about that breakthrough. Yeah, thank you very much, Jeff. Um, to really talk about ABS, accelerated breeding scheme, I would like to give you very, in a very simple way, the breed, conventional sweet potato breeding. Um, sweet potato is, a, a breeding sweet potato is very complex because the generic of sweet potato is an exploit. So if you see during the sexual reproduction, when you see these six set of chromosomes being, being it's during the reproduction, anything can happen. That is why the variability, any seed that you cross to parents, any seed you collect, you can select for anything you want. So a conventional breeding process takes many years because you plant the seed in the, in the nursery, then they germinate, then you take this seed into what you call the next step, which is the clonal evaluation. Then you go, for example, to other stage until you, variety, you release a variety. It takes seven to eight years. If you are talking in a country like some parts of Uganda, where you have a bimodal type of rainfall distribution. But if you're talking in a country like, for example, uh, that just have one unimodal rain pattern, then it may take you much more time. So as you cross your seat, then you increase the amount, you take it to one location, then it goes to two locations, then it keep on going until you you are in the stage where the farmers, the farmers are able to come and the farmers are able to select together with the researcher what they need. So this takes so many years and usually we find a lot of constraint in the past because donors are not willing to sponsor any program that takes so many years to deliver one output. So therefore, together with our, our colleague in Lima, Peru, we develop what we call a slate breeding scheme, which cut the time to release a variety in half. Instead of taking eight years, we cut it to four years. But on what, what consists the slate breeding scheme? Usually instead of taking the, 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 the material, the, the, the cutting to several, it's year, year one in one location, then you increase in another location, what we do, one seed, one seed is, is multiplied very, very fast in the screen house after you germinate them. It gives you, for example, 12, 12 different e, e, e plantlets that we take to several agroecology at the same time, in simultaneous. Then you evaluate them in simultaneous. But if you look into the, our environment, which is uh, Southern Africa, where one of our major constraints is a drought, so you evaluate them and under the drought, you impose that drought, and then after you finish that, then you take those other sites where you have the virus and maybe nutrient deficiency. And the first year you do, in the, in the first year you finish your observation trial or clonal evaluation. Second year you do your pre preliminary and uh, advanced yield trial. On the third year you are already in putting in your multi-location trials in every site together with on-farm trials. So in the fourth year, you are able to really get all the information. But what helps us so very much on this process is, is because we have this, uh, this rapid screening, the near-infrared, which help you very fast to see what material has the nutrient you need and you select them and you take them up. Of course, our breeding program is to look into uh, high levels of beta carotene, drought tolerance, and also the taste. Because no matter what you do, if the sweet potato does not taste very well, very good to the farmer, you, it will not be adopted. So this, in this process, we managed to, in Mozambique, to have two 
deliver of, 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 of material that is drought tolerant. For example, in 2011, using this accelerated breeding scheme, we released about 15 drought tolerant varieties. Four years later, we released another seven drought tolerant varieties in 2016, February. So it is possible and we speed up, and those materials are, ve are very much taken by the farmers. So this accelerated breeding scheme really has revolutionized the speed at which you can take it to the farmer. But I think of taking it to the farmer in another dimension as well, not only how quickly the innovations and the improvements can get to market, but also broad geographic scope. And I learned of another interesting approach that, on that, that really helps on that second dimension, having a community of practice of the breeders, and I think, Robert, you've been instrumental in that. So can you share a little bit about how, how that community is structured and how you were able then to expand the geographic scope? My understanding is 2005, there were maybe two countries that was uh, doing the, the sweet potato breeding. Where are we today? Oh, thank you. Uh, first of all, around before 2009, there were really two or three breeding, national breeding programs that were actively breeding and raising varieties. That is Uganda, uh, Mozambique, and Ghana. So the others, really, they were, if they were, they were activities, maybe they were just selecting uh, varieties. So the national, the other countries had to be brought up. Uh, first of all, the capacity. That is, the breeders had to be trained. And here we, uh, we thank Agra Alliance for, uh, for Green Revolution in Africa, had to uh, support uh, training, PhD, master's level breeders to come out and start breeding. And then to fund the national programs to do the breeding. In the meantime, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation supported what we call uh, support platforms. The, the programs in Uganda, Ghana, and, and Mozambique to uh, who have capacity, the infrastructure, the equipment, near, near infrared spectroscopy that Maria has mentioned, who could uh, do the rapid screening and handling large numbers of uh, breeding materials. The national programs had to be trained we, you know, the cereal crops have a far ahead compared to the to sweet potato. And so you either speak the same language and understand each other, then you can compare results. Or if you don't speak the same language, you will be doing dif different things yeah. and you can't move together. So there was this training. You, uh, we had to actually copy and modify what CIMIT is doing, the so-called uh, CIMIT uh, field book. And we designed something similar to that so that breeders can select and do the breeding and release varieties in a similar manner. And this way, in combining what Maria has described, accelerated breeding, with the uh, training and meeting and uh, exchanging information from dif in different places on the continent, even outside the continent. We had at one time to go to Ghent for breeders to update their knowledge in terms of handling materials and analyzing data and raising these varieties, taking care of what actually is necessary to, to release a variety that will stand and that is, adapt that is preferred by the farmers and the consumers. And so in this way, we have developed a community of practice. Uh, breeders speaking the same language, doing uh, breeding in a similar way, following similar protocols, so that results are comparable. And we have been able also to bring up on board uh, projects on developing genom genomic tools because we don't want to lag behind. And so we are working together basically to try and solve the problems that are preventing uh, increasing productivity, but also producing varieties that are preferred 
for the farmers. We are talking about orange flesh sweet potato high in beta carotene, high in vitamin A. And so the focus is solve the major problem in East, in East Africa, East and Central Africa is viruses, Southern Africa is drought. In West Africa, the, the problem is a bit different because we are breeding for less sweet, sweet potato. But we, in, each, in each of this uh, sub-region, there is a major bottleneck. You get rid of that, and then you, add, you go ahead with the rest of the preferred varieties and combine them. So each national program has ta needs to tailor the, to, to target the, uh, the consumers. They are a bit different on the continent. And so in this way, we have been able to quickly release varieties uh, to that meet the farmers' needs and consumers' needs. I love that. So you had different outcomes that were desired, but you had a common support platform and a common language, kind of like in software having a consistent user experience. I, uh, I appreciate that. <laughs> oh, Jan. Yeah, Jeff, is a, I can just add, we call this group the Speed Breeders. <laughs> the, under the Sweet Potato and Profit and Health Initiative, they meet annually. They have very cool orange sunglasses. And, um, and I was really proud uh, this year because when I walked into the room, combining with the breeders that we work with in Peru and the United States, there were 33 sweet potato breeders in the room. And that is truly a community of practice. So since 2009, this group has now released over 100 sweet potato varieties uh, in different countries of which 70 are orange flushed. Wow, very good. Speed breeders, that's, uh, that's pretty catchy, Jan. Um, okay, I wanna continue on the thread on, on breeding. Uh, I think your results were largely or, or exclusively uh, delivered through conventional breeding. If I remember correctly, about three years ago, uh, the laureates were recognized for, for work in biotech crops. So I'm wondering, when it comes to addressing these micronutrient deficiencies, do you see cases uh, or instances where you think uh, biotech approaches are gonna be necessary or justified in order to be able to get the outcome that we'd like to see from a health standpoint? Um, how do you, your thoughts? Yeah, when, we, um, when we started with Harvest Plus, we had to set targets for specific minerals and vitamins uh, for specific crops. So for example, white maize has zero vitamin A in it, and we had to ask the nutritionist, how high does the vitamin A have to be to be, have a public health impact? And they told us 15 parts per million. Then we took that number to the breeders and we said, can you breed for that? And they said, yes, we think we can. Then we showed them the number for iron and they said, no, we, based on what's available in our germplasm banks, we can't. We can't breed for iron and maize. And we got the same answer for rice, and we got the same answer for wheat, for iron. So Harvest Plus commissioned some upstream research. Well, maybe, maybe there's something that could be done with iron. We can't address it. Those are the three major food staples in the world. Maybe we can do something with transgenic approaches for iron. Maybe not. So we, we commissioned some upstream research, which started in Australia and uh, continued to, to Erie and, and was also tested at SEAD in Colombia. And now we have a proof of concept rice, which, is, which meets our target for iron. Rice has two parts per million iron, the normal rices and milled rice. This transgenic has 15 parts per million iron, which should have a public health impact. It's the most widely eaten food staple in the world, and iron deficiency is the most widespread uh, deficiency among, among micronutrients. It could have a tremendous impact. And what was a bonus, an unexpected bonus, the zinc went up much higher than we were able to breed uh, conventionally, even though we hit our target in the conventional breeding, this, tr this same rice is much higher, it went way above the target. So it's high in iron and high in zinc. 
So uh, because of all the constraints, the extra hoops that you have to jump through in, in deregulating and being able to release the transgenic, um, it's, still, it's still five years away at minimum before we, can, uh, before we can make that available to farmers. So definitely there's some, some real breakthroughs that can be made in biotech. Well, that's fan fantastic. And, and Robert, I'd like to get your perspective uh, being located on the African continent and how you're thinking about the balance of conventional breeding, biotech breeding in, in this instance. We would have already been into practice if, we, if uh, sweet potato wasn't complex. Um, uh, Maria already mentioned that sweet potato uh, is a hexaploid. It has 90 chromosomes. They are tiny. The more the number of chromosomes, the, the more headache you will get. Until now, of course, the scientists, the biotechnologists are still struggling. It's, it's not easy to deal with. But the thing is, Take, for example, sweet potato weevil. The breeders have been breeding, entomologists have been breeding since I was born. I'm already 62 years. They have no solution. In a case like that, where uh, you don't have a solution, the breeders are telling you they are going to break, to break through and nothing comes out. And if you look to other crops and they have solutions and you think it can work, then you take that way. This is the, the wheat we have, we eat now, lots of the useful genes for resistance to many of these diseases came from, wild, from the wild. And so they, they were brought into maize, into, into corn. And so if you have a source, if you have genes that will work and solve the problem, then you take that, you take that channel instead of waiting and the answer never comes. And so, yes, we are working for, if we can come up with molecular markers that can help us solve the, uh, the problem of viruses, uh, and then for transgenic approach for, uh, for if there is a, a solution to, to get rid of the weevils, then we will take that route. And so, really, the question is that we really ask, is there a, is there a uh, a shortcut using uh, conventional breeding? If the answer is no, but there is a possibility of using transgenic approach, if you don't feed the people, you will feed the weevils. <laughs> I like that. We should take that to the public. Um, let's switch gears. I think one of the things that fascinates me about your work is the way in which you've developed partnerships. I mean, take for example, the intersection between, intersections between agriculture and human health. It's, I don't think all that typical histor in, in history that you've got plant breeders and nutrition experts working together, yet that was a fundamental part of the success here. So I'd like you to share how you were able to build these strong partnerships between the communities and then also how you made the case to, to donors that these were high leverage investments. Jan, maybe let's start with you. Oh, thank you, Jeff. Well, I think, you know, I've told this story many times that when we fir I first went around with the proposal to do the research in Mozambique, it took me three and a half years to get it funded. Uh, because I would go to the donor community and say, they, the health people say, well, this is an ag proposal. I go to the ag people, they say it's a health proposal. Um, and I always will deeply thank Vinkatesh Manar of the Micronutrient Initiative because he saw the potential and the leakage. And once he was on board, then I was able to get additional support from USAID and the, the Rockefeller Foundation and start. Um, but I think even when you have the two different people in the room, I would, um, you have to have them listen to each other and learn these, each other's language because they speak different languages. Breeders talk in PPMs and you know, uh, nutritionists talk and retinol activity equivalent units. You have to give them a conversion table so they can start talking in the same units and communicating with each other. And you have to, at the beginning, now we don't have to do it, but. I often, I, I, my team, which is not just breeders and nutritionists, but economists and agronomists and food scientists, 
you have to make them sit in the room and listen to each other because everybody's too siloed and it's breaking down the walls. You have to learn enough about the other field yeah. to appreciate the other field. And uh, that's taken some time. And people often say, well, I'm busy. I'll just sit in on my sessions. And I say, no, you have to sit on all the sessions. Because if you don't understand what your colleagues are doing, you can't see how you can work together. Yeah, yeah that's fantastic. I, I think you know, my experience <clears throat> in working with academia is that to some extent, they necessarily did need to create the silos in order to get the deep expertise. Yet what we really care about is how we can adapt what we learn through solutions and the interdisciplinary approaches are, are, are critical. Anybody, any other comments on this year? Howdy. Uh, well, I'll, just, uh, I'll just give the example. I spoke before about setting a target for the breeders. When we, when we first asked the nutritionists what the number should be, they said, well, it depends. It depends on how much people are eating. It depends on whether it's a child. It depends on whether it's a mother. Uh, it depends on the bioavailability, so you can't pick a, a specific number. And it took them a while of talking to the breeders to understand why the breeders needed a single number. And finally they understood it and finally they were, the nutritionists were able to say, okay, we'll pick a number and under these assumptions this is, this is the number we pick. But I, I think um, in addition to that, uh, we do have different institutions and different disciplines working together. And I think everybody's got to have the vision. You, gotta, you have to give them a vision. So um, I, I sometimes say that I hope a, a grandchild 20 years from now will ask her, her grandmother, did there used to be white maize? You know, that, that it's all been converted over. Carrots used to be white. Now they're orange. The same could happen with maize. And once you give the breeders and the nutritionists and the extension agents and the communicators and everybody that vision, then everybody understands, okay, we've got to work together to make this happen. Got it. Great. Thank you. I want to expand on the partnership point because I think, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a key to success here is how we, we uh, uh, have interdisciplinary approaches and adapt. And one of the, my experiences at the Gates Foundation, a lot of emphasis on the upstream work, but at the end of the day, we've got to have the so-called downstream or delivery work. And I think part of the success here and part of taking it to the farmer has been the way in which you've approached the combination of not just product development, but product delivery. So maybe Maria, you can share a little bit about how you formed a comprehensive approach over the course of these projects to really ensure that we, what was created got to the farmer. Thank you. So as a breeder, we produce variety. But if this variety stay with us, it has no meaning. So I see a breeder as a potential extension agent. So, in, so when I talk about deliver, we are talking about vine deliver to the farmers. But there are a series of, of steps that you have to take along the pathway to make sure that through this delivery process, you are successful. For example, uh, it's very different if you are delivering a vine in a place where you have problems with drought, or if you are delivering a vine in a place where you have normal rainfall distribution. So also, you have to really look on the capacity of those people what Jeff was calling partners, that is assisting you in this delivery process if they really know uh, how to deliver. For example, in my, in my delivery, I always make sure if I'm talking about the variety Melinda, that everybody helping me to bring this variety into the farmers, they understand this is Melinda, and they understand all the attributes of this variety. So you need to be very sure that Melinda is not, uh, is not the variety we call Lawrence, that is, was released very recently. <laughs> they, they, there must be a clear morphological distinction because you don't want them to mix. So all these partners must have a common language, a common understanding of what variety is and which agroecology, each of every one of these varieties are to be 
uh, very successful and uh, later on to be released, later on to be, to be adopted. So there is a series of planning process throughout because you don't want to come and deliver uh, in a place where there is a severe drought. The farmer will take your material and then trash it under the banana tree if the banana tree is still alive. So you, you fell completely. So all the steps are planned in such a way that everything is coming at the right place, at the right moment, using the right, right person to deliver. That is why there is a comprehensive training from the public extension service, private sector, all those that are, are, are having a common goals are in the process to deliver the seed. If we see, for example, during our stages in Mozambique, we have several stages because Mozambique is a, is a country of catastrophe. You have drought this year, next year maybe is a flood. So you have to come with a mechanism to really look into sweet potato as a food security and deliver the seed at the right time. So we are constantly on planning process to make sure that sweet potato will be available for food security and also for nutrition. For example, during the emergency that we had a lot uh, on the year, year 2000 or before, we, we, mass, we, we multiply the planting material at the research station. And then what we did, we fill up lorries and lorries, we paint this lorry in all different colors, the orange colors, we all, all design, and come into the village. We got in the village, but uh, there was no radio program, nothing. As we reach in the village, maybe there is a funeral, maybe there is everything. We delivered the seed and went back to where we came from, and nobody planted any seed. And nobody planted any seed. And that is why, for example, later on we modify our system and we put it like what we call it decentralized vine multiplier, which is a, a multiplication that is taking place in the district, around the community, and serving the community. And you use seed voucher that whenever the farmer thinks is the time appropriate to go to this multiplier and get their seed, they call it, they go. But around this, this DVM, there is a many training programs taking place. Because DVM is a promoter there. Any farmer coming to collect the seed, he is the one to teach the farmer how to plant and when to harvest. What are the pests and the disease they should take care of during, during, throughout the, gro the growing. So we create a lot of demand, demand, a lot of training, demand creation, painting out. If you see, come into our field, you look from the far distance, the, 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 the labeling is all orange. And we create also around the road, we put the name of this decentralized vine multiplier, the, their name and their telephone number. If anybody's interested in getting the seed, they will call, they go, they purchase, or maybe they have the voucher, they come, they collect. So there is a lot of planning process to make sure that uh, that this take place. But the, during this demand creation, you see, it's quite interesting. Sweet potato one, I came in Mozambique in the year 1996. Nobody wanted to talk about it. It was a poor people crops. One time in 1997, I went to Nambula. I went to this village they call Murupula. They were taking bread, breakfast with sweet potato. The wife of that man called Portugal hide because nobody can eat sweet potato in there. But today, the government of Mozambique included it in their agriculture investment that plan. Is it is considered problem. one of the top priority for the country, and it's taking up. It's no longer a poor person crop. Great. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. So we're almost out of time, and I want to make sure that we get your thoughts about the future. Uh, you know, two billion people around the world suffering from micronutrient malnutrition. How should the ag and nutrition sectors really take this work forward? What do you see as the most promising pathways? And use this as your opportunity to give your final thoughts. So I'm going to let each of you go ahead and, and uh, address this. And if there's, yeah, so... First, Jan, I think you, uh, you had a sense of a, a pathway. Well, we've talked about the ag nutrition pathway, which we need to continue to expand. But I have to show 
This is shelf storable sweet potato puree, steamed and mashed sweet potato in a vacuum packed bag, which we've had for four months with preservatives. And we feel that this can be a breakthrough product for incorporating sweet potato into bakery products in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, many countries import most, if not all, of their wheat flour, and we can have farmers substituting, this can substitute 30 to 50 percent of the wheat flour content, making a golden product. And if you look to Asia, most of the sweet potato is used for processing or animal feed. Only 10 percent is eaten boiled or steamed as they do in Sub-Saharan Africa. So we feel this opens up new markets for farmers and is one innovative way for moving forward. Great. Thank you. Robert. Big success story, but it's like you, today you have a new baby, but you have lost one child is dying. Can we arrest that by working together? It's possible. Right. Thank you. Howdy. If you, um, if you come back uh, 20 years from now, all the, all the current crop varieties being grown will have been replaced by new varieties that have come out of agricultural research centers. So one of the main things that we have to do is mainstream breeding for these minerals and vitamins in the breeding programs. You can't see iron, taste iron, can't see zinc, can't taste zinc. So for example, um, if you have a, a heat tolerant bean uh, that's going to spread around Africa as the temperature gets higher and higher, and you piggyback on high iron in the heat tolerant bean, uh, pretty soon, most of, the, most of the beans being grown and consumed will be the uh, high iron beans. So that's, that, to me, that's the basic strategy, and that's what we need to do. Great. Thank you very much. Maria. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the sector is multi-sectorial. Uh, but I would say my boss, Wolfgang Grunberg, in Lima, Peru, always tell me, Maria, the pump must run. It means the work is continuing. So I look into research to pump all the time, but at the same time, we need to look into markets, into processing, and also the policy, we have the minister here, must be in place to really help us to really take, take the malnutrition up to where we, should, we, 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 we need to be. Got to get the job done now. Now, Jan, sweet potato puree is that what stand, is that what our lunch is today? Just checking in. I would hope so. <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay, I want to turn to the audience and say, here are your 2016 World Food Prize laureates. Yeah.